morning. And good morning to our room chair, Clover, and representative from the different branches of the Buddhist institution from around the world. I'm so honored and so privileged to be here. And I'm so nervous to speak at the same time. I'll try my best. And uh, first of all, I would like to start with uh, my deep and sincere gratitude to His Majesty the King, because through Him we are here together. Throughout the history, India has a noble kingdom who are very favored to Buddhism, who sponsor to build a temple and universities. And of course, over the time, change. And then, over the time, south of India, different noble family, kingdoms, donated, sponsored, built a temple, carved into a stone. And like an example, in China, in Korea, Japan, in Southeast Asia, and then especially Tibet and Bhutan. It's like a, a, like a one family, Vajrayana country. You know, so, and how due to the, the blessings and the guidance of His Majesty the King, because many noble king can be just a, be a noble king. You know, what makes him great, not because I'm a good means, because he promotes the second. You know, everybody has a choice to believe. You know, with the different branches of Buddhism coming together, discussing, not just saying that my opinion is very important, you know, but rather sharing and debating and exchanging the ideas as the senior privileges and women have explained the importance of the Vajrayana conference in the beginning of the session, which I will not you know, explain furthermore. That's the one thing, so that's my one sincere gratitude to His Majesty. The second gratitude goes to the 17th Jacob because he is the spiritual head of Bhutan and due to his kindness and compassion all the different branches of the different Buddhist faith not just Tibetan Buddhist practice not just Theravada, not just Mahayana but throughout the world coming here is also due to his blessing due to his guidance and followed by Lugan and his representative, and my sincere gratitude to, to our Jacob as well, his audience. And the third is I want to thank um, first Tasha Kamabra. I'm sure he's very busy with so many responsibilities as we have witnessed since last night. And has no sense of entitlement, always engaging everywhere where it's needed. And that's a great leadership. And uh, through him and uh, Professor Ian Baker, who is also a mentor, and both of them told me to come here and share my experience. And I was very happy, very excited to be here and to demonstrate the Nibuma Yoga. And, uh, thank you very much for this invitation, opportunities, and blessings. That's, that's the first thing I want to say. Now, please judge me if I'm running out of time, otherwise, I'll get a punishment from the Dutch. <laughs> 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 <Respect. clears throat> uh, regarding the Vajrayana, and as a Buddhist practitioner, as a one family, has been addressed in a previous session, which I don't have to repeat that again. I want to go to the basic, mainly because I'm poorly educated, I'm not a knowledgeable person, no scholar, or a realized being, and I'm not trying to make you think that I'm a humble either. <laughs> That's a very big manipulation when somebody says, I'm a very humble being. I'm not trying to make you think I'm humble. I'm just telling you the way it is from my side. Um, I think the first step of being Buddhist is being sincere to oneself. That's very important. Not to your neighbors, 
to yourself. <laughs> Once you are more sincere to yourself, then the idea of loving kindness, as His Holiness Dalai Lama stated many times around the world, becomes fact and logic and reasonable approach in the worldwide community. Otherwise, my Buddhism, my Vajrayana ideas only cannot be spread thoroughly to the public because we need to start with a common ground and that common ground is to be sincere and to be kind and to be loving. It's a beautiful idea. But in order to have that, you need to develop inner peace. You know? Inner peace can be developed based on analytical understanding, by like studying, receiving teachings. Also, it can be understood by practicing, meditating, doing retreat, or you can combine both and also achieve inner peace. Yeah. So, so that's something that we have to understand, that ideas are very beautiful. In the Russian conference, people come together. But first basic principle is to be sincere to oneself. One of the Shamba master, because I'm a Shamba practitioner, in Shamba lineage, one of the masters said, Tuna Sanjir, Matuna Sanjir. It's very simple, beautiful. You know, if you're under the influence of the illusion, you are a sentient being. If you're absent from the illusion, you are an enlightened being. It's very simple, you know, because we are here, we, you can call it samsaric world, or the suffering world, or the unhappiness world, whatever you like to call it, it is all under the illusion of our ego, and our pride, and our attachment. In order to reduce the attachment, and that ego, and that fixation, you need to develop a new realm of reality, which is to keep a little bit of distance from the idea of the ego and the self-centered attitude. If you can minimize a little bit of the self-centered attitude, naturally there will be a sincerity from the heart. If you try too hard to be compassionate, it will never work, it will disappoint you. Because it is not an emotion that you can copy and print and imitate and pretend. Compassion is a realization state of mind that will start from being sincere. If you're sincere, you're honest. If you're honest, at least you have a less disturbing thoughts in your mind, which means you have a more space in your mind, which creates the foundation to meditate. Once you develop that space to meditate, and then understanding and the taste of happiness and bliss can be experienced. Without creating the space in your mind, thinking that I want to be enlightened, doesn't work. Like, you know, the idea of the enlightenment is beautiful, it's great, but to understand how our emotion functions, and seeing the, the reality of the anger, the reality of the jealousy, not the conclusion, just the emotion itself. The conclusion is already there around the world. Like Nashua said, there's a Ukrainian war going on. I was there in Germany. There was immense refugee coming, 20,000 refugee coming every day in Berlin. I see that. I do some charity work, whatever I can do within my capacity. I'm not a government or a rich man or any sort of things like that. You know? So, in order to bring you know, some sort of a, uh, a peace in our mind is to understand, not the conclusion. Conclusion is already there. If you read a history book, the conclusion is already there. The manipulation, the misuse of religion and politics, it's already there. We have seen it, witnessed it for a long, long time. It's nothing new. But the way to change it from the course of the history of repeating the same mistake <coughs> is to have a logical perspective towards your emotion circumstance and examine the very examining the very reality of the emotion itself. Like an example, 
when you say, I am very angry due to that person. You have the idea of that person. But if you examine in your mind, where is that person? Is the person the head? Is the person is anything from the bottom of the head? You know, which part of that person is the actual person? <clears throat> you are angry to that person. You believe that you are angry. But where is the definition of the anger? Because your mind believing in that. When you define the very examining, the very state of the anger, then you come to the conclusion there is no such thing as anger. I know I've been angry many, many, many times in my responsibility, so don't think I'm in the, some sort of a cave mountain, no challenge, you know. I've been challenged so many times throughout my life. Because when you brought up in the monastery, you know, you are trained to think perfect. Sentient being, what is Shiva, be good, everything will be fine. But when you come to the reality of your responsibility, it's a little bit uglier than that. <laughs> so, therefore, it's very important to examine the very reality of the anger, the jealousy, the state of the ignorance. And then, once you have a conclusion again and again, again and again, then you will have a more sense of renunciation that, oh, I'm making the same mistake over and over and over again. And therefore, that is the first step of renunciation. You don't need to renounce like a Bilareva. I mean, he's a great master. But you don't have to do the black magic part. <laughs> he's a great master, but just avoid the black magic part. You know? Just copy his renunciation part. You know? So, renunciation, we cannot compare ourselves like the Buddha Shatamuni, where he has to go through three eons. Or like the hardship of the Teloba and Naropa. Or like the Chungo Nandra when he passed through Tibet, Nepal, India, and receiving the teachings in Bodhgaya from Niguma herself, and from Sukhasiddhi, and from 150 masters, you know. We don't have to push ourselves like that. We should not copy the hardship of the great masters. We should never do that. That is a first mistake. Because you cannot imitate somebody. By imitating somebody, cannot give you happiness. That is the crisis of the modern world. We try to imitate ourselves by seeing somebody that appears to be happy. So, you shift to the spirituality and you repeat the same mistake with a different image. You understand? You know, you're repeating the same thing. It's like you move this chair to another chair to be a little bit comfortable, but it's not the same, same chair. And you're still sitting on the chair. You know, so there's no difference. So in order to have a broad understanding with the logic and the reason of the circumstance and the situation of your own anger and jealousy and ignorance, we need to understand the, the meaning of the subtle body and the subtle mind. Before you even get to the idea of recognizing the nature of the mind, the Buddha Buddhahood and all of that. First, we need to understand the subtle body and the subtle mind. In order to recognize the subtle body and subtle mind, you need to have discipline. You know, not like a forced discipline, but sense of what is repetitive cycle of mistake, seeing that cycle of mistake, then renouncing that bit by bit, bit by bit. You know, and the philosophy of renunciation has to combine together in a path of spirituality along for a long journey, many people, you know, whether you are new Buddhist practitioner or old Buddhist practitioner, when they become Buddhist, the first thing they do is, I am going to do Mundro. And then, Yidam. Then, it's a written practice, the creation and the completion practice. And then, they receive a little bit of Mahamudra teaching. Then they say, okay, now I understand everything. <laughs> but they're still miserable. <laughs> and unhappy person. You know, so knowing everything is not everything. Experiencing it, knowing it, combining it together is very important. You know, so therefore, renunciation, little by little, no pressure, little by little, as you progress with your practice, sense of detachment will come by itself. That's why we are practicing deity. The very purpose of the practicing deity is to reduce the ordinary quality. That is the whole purpose. It's nothing to do with accumulating to be more powerful or magical or spiritual or mystical. None of that. I mean, it motivates different type of people. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good lie. 
<laughs> you know, like the letter that said, the Buddha is a big liar. But he didn't lie for one day, the nature of mind. You know? So it's a good lie. That this, this will make you powerful, magical, spiritual, enlightened in three months, two months, two weeks. All of that big claim. It's beautiful and a good lie to motivate a certain individual who are hard to convince. But nowadays, with the Google information, it's very hard to convince anybody. <laughs> Other than focusing on what is within your body. And that's why I decided to bring the Nibuma Yoga to promote a Buddhism in a way so that we can promote the mental and physical well-being. And I myself, I did a, a blood test a few months ago because I did 700 sessions of yoga you know, in one year, which is like three times, four times per day. And of course, when I was in the three years retreat, I did my yoga. And I'm in love with that practice. Why? Because you can feel it. Not in a very sensorial world, like for example, I'm feeling this and I'm feeling that. But more into a subtle level of experience, where your mind and body becomes one, and a meditative experience, and it can accumulate over the months and weeks. You know? So, Therefore, I find it very important to promote the Nibuma Yoga because, oh yeah, talking about the level sign base in my small budget science research. Um, so six months ago, like last year, during that six months in last year, I was doing a very intensive yoga practice every day because it was locked down, not so much traveling. So I said, why not? Let this be a little bit of experience. So I did my yoga every day, you know, I do my daily practice, I do yoga every day, four, four or five times a day, six times a day, every day, 20, 27 postures in one session, it takes 45 to 35 minutes. And I didn't do any other form of sport other than the yoga walk. Then after a few months of that, I was in Hawaii, I gave a teaching because we have a meditation center here and there. And at that time, I spoke with one physician and said, could you take a blood test because I would like to make a little bit of research what is the condition of my blood sugar, I don't have a high sugar problem, uh, but uh, what is the condition of my internal body. So he took a blood test, you know, a few capsules, probably six, seven, for my liver, kidney, heart, lungs, and then for thyroid, the metal in my body, you know, the quality of my blood, all of it. So all of them, all of them came back perfectly balanced. Only my blood pressure is a little bit high because I had a big argument a few hours before that. <laughs> so, so that's that. And I just want to say that this is my prayer and aspiration because Bhutan is the last Vajrayana country and it is not just my responsibility all the Rinpoche's and Kempo's and Durban's and different representatives diff different representative from the different Buddhist branch to carry on the responsibility. All of us, we are lineage holder of the Lord Buddha's teaching. All of us, we have a responsibility. You know? In the normal world, you need to be successful by a certain age. To be enlightened, you don't need to be successful by a certain age. <laughs> it's an ageless, timeless, and a beautiful experience if you can practice accurately. You know? And the Vajrayana teachings in general, everything is permitted if you explain appropriately. If you don't explain appropriately, everything is incorrect. You know? so, so that's that. And I want to say thank you to the Center for Bhutan and GNS Studies and the Dasan in, of the main in the in official religion of Bhutan. Thank you very much for everything that all the things that you have organized, all the volunteers who worked very hard for the event to make all the preparation day and night. And thank you Dasana for a very informal introduction because I was a little bit nervous in the beginning. <laughs> Shaking a little bit, pretending not to be nervous. <laughs> but uh, that should have made me very calm. So, logically, he's my guru. <laughs> to make my mind calm. Thank you, everybody.